I want to welcome everybody in my tie. Um, it makes me feel like a dean now, after Frederick's uh, comments, um, to the, our conference, uh, to Université de Montréal, to RUD, to and PKP's partnership, that this really represents a, a culmination, but not the completion of. Um, we recognize Tanya and the other uh, team members from ARUD that we have been working together for a good number of years, um, and this is like a coming home for us, to, to work, to establish a conference together, to be in the same room for the last two days in the sprint, um, and to look forward to future projects uh, in this collaboration. So this is an old Canadian story uh, between the East and the West, the Francophone, the Quebecois, and the rest of Canada, and it's one I'm very proud and, and interested in continuing. Um, we did the sprint in probably not the most interesting building in all of the Université de Montréal uh, over the last uh, two days, so what a pleasure to be in this building. This is industrial design. Um, and I just want to pause for a moment on that notion because what we are doing with, the, with PKP, with Erudit, and with other related projects is we are the future, I'm hoping, of industrial design. That the industries of the future will be more open, they will have less smoke and pollution, um, but they will be very, very committed to design to notions of how to solve problems, to notions about how to make people's lives richer and maybe easier in some ways, and to how to be more inclusive uh, on a global scale uh, in a way that the last industrial revolution wasn't so much. So this idea that we should meet in places like this and recognize their history is very, very important to me. And I want to do a little bit of history. Brian gave you a bit of it. Um, the 1998 start for this project, when we had no idea what this would mean. It was before there was a term, open access. I was voting, as many of you know, for free to read, and we lost. Um, and open access raises all kinds of questions around who owns it and where it's going. But I'm happy with the, the, the growth of it, and I want to talk a bit about that in a moment. I also want to recognize the benefactor, the role of society and the academy. Uh, Frederic introduced that notion of our responsibilities, about, and particularly around students, and I want to address that as well. I also want to get a little philosophical in honor of his own tradition and discipline. Um, but this idea that, that we have a, a responsibility uh, in terms of our design and in terms of our thinking is an important aspect. Uh, for us. And our benefactors, that is, the, those who support this work, those who have trust in this work, are not always just the federal government up the road, are not always just the provincial governments, but in fact are private benefactors. So the Public Knowledge Project, and many of you, or some of you at least will know this, was started with an endowment from the Pacific Press. I know. It owns both of the newspapers in Vancouver in the true spirit of democracy, as I've noted many times. You have a single owner of all the newspapers. It you know, takes care of a few of the questions that sometimes arise. When I assumed the, the chair or the uh, title of Pacific Press Professor, um, the press was owned, uh, sorry, the Pacific Press was owned by Conrad Black. And I'm very happy to report that he has now been released <laughs> from prison. Uh, and that all of that is behind him, and he refused at the time to give us any more financial support, thank God, or I would have had to join him perhaps. But at any rate, the generosity of the benefactor, the no-strings-attached gift from Pacific Press, who thought that there was some future in technology that the Vancouver Sun had not yet recognized completely, and I'm not going to take you through the story of our stumbling attempt um, to work in terms of the technology and, and research online with the newspaper. But I want to recognize that that kind of support and the way in which we need to look to the larger world to gain that support and the way in which we enact that trust is a very important part. That was 1998. No software at the time in terms of our thinking. I originally thought we would convince the world by argument that the internet in the 90s, if you can remember the 90s, was even more chaotic than it is now. Everybody was stumbling, everything was kind of distributed on different file systems, and everybody was proposing different ideas, and mine was that we could distribute all of knowledge. What we learned is that people in 1993 had already started, had already started email journals, and that that process was spontaneously underway. And what we tried to do is to build a platform for others 
to take a step into this new world. We didn't start a journal, and then originally we didn't even host. In fact, in principle, we didn't host. We only built the ladder for others. We only wanted to be a vehicle for their expression. We only wanted to move journals online in the 90s. Do you remember that when that was the question? That moving a journal online would automatically drain it of any integrity and value and worth? That was the argument in 1999. And we thought that had to be overcome by some manner in order that we could begin to talk about a wider global distribution. Because even then it was obvious that the World Wide Web, as it was, the information highway, was going to be global. And that was an important aspect and opportunity for the sharing of knowledge that we hadn't experienced before. Let me jump ahead to 2007 in terms of this history, because in 2007, the PKP team decided we needed a conference. And we held our first conference in Vancouver in 2007, with about, a f actually there were seven more people than are here today, I don't know why. Um, but it was an event where we started to build the community in person. And Brian's experience of, not, of working with people never having met them, we realized needed to have a periodic time when we could meet people, when we could get together again with people we'd met four or five years ago and have an opportunity to sit down and talk with them again. In 2007, we had approximately 3,000 journals using OJS. But that's an exaggeration, because I know in 2003, we had almost no journals using OJS. And only now we can retrospectively see that, in fact, apparently in 1991, there were hundreds of journals using OJS. No, in fact, their content is from 1991. But in that period, uh, that is, from 2001 when we released the software with zero journals to 2007, it was a slow one journal at a time game. Now, I would love to be able to announce to today that at 2017, that we're at 10,000 journals as we've announced three or four times in the past, um, but I can't. We keep improving the accuracy of our count, and we are currently, as of this morning, although Juan may be updating it, Okay, we'll get an update in a few moments. Wait, there's a call from New Brunswick. Sorry, I need to take this, just one second. I don't know whether I'm Lady Gaga or on a call center somewhere. At any rate, <laughs> if you can imagine how many times I've heard those words cross Juan Pablo Alperin's lips. All right, 10,035 journals. Uh, globally distributed, Juan will be talking later about the, some of the demographics we have about those journals. Um, but this idea that, that there has been a movement in terms of the access to knowledge since that initial period of 1998 through ni sorry, 2000, 2007 and on to 2017, I want to focus on in a particular way. I want to say that this is not a critical moment so much as a tipping point. And I want to draw attention to a few of the major players in that. But first, let me give credit to, to Frederick's, point about, Frederick's point about students. Because in the last month, we have had a revitalization of the high school peer-reviewed journal. In 2003, I want to say, at Gladstone Secondary School in Vancouver, we had our first high school journal. Started by Sarah Toomey, a teacher there. It was all girls. I was very proud of it. They decided to call their journal in 2003. It's still online. It's been archived. It's not been active since 2003 or 2004. Uh, they called it the Pink Voice. Now, they didn't do a Google search in those days to see whether who else had the pink voice, but just think for a moment. It probably wasn't the most appropriate title for a high school journal. In the two years that I worked with them, and Sarah led them, I just stepped in every once in a while, the most amazing development was the first issue in the first year had a column called Fashion News. The second year, they changed that to Philosophical Views. Frederic would be very happy. Inside that, which I opened with great anticipation, would it be John Locke, Wittgenstein, Nietzsche? It was love. They had an advice column 
that was peer-reviewed on issues of love, and they called it Philosophical Views. This month, we had 14 journals launched in the Bay Area by a number of high schools, and in fact, one middle school. Um, and I'm working with a student at Stanford right now to build a journal in a box for high schools that will enable them to very easily assemble, convince people to serve, um, and undertake this kind of commitment at the student level. Because in the country that I'm currently working, we have a great need, a huge vacuum, if you like, which nature abhors around the truth, around verification, around authority and trust around knowledge. And the idea that high school students would think about how can we verify what kind of checks and balances. And if I didn't get an email on Monday that said one of the articles in the high school journal had been plagiarized and someone had detected it and they wanted to know what checks and balances were in place to prevent this in the future. The journal only had one issue. Mind you, it had about 85 articles. So this idea that we are building a culture on a very old tradition. Jean-Claude Guidon first brought our attention to Henry Oldenburg, who started the journal for the Royal Society, or not for the Royal Society, using the Royal Society in 1665. This tradition of trust and authority, very much in need today, very much an issue for students to begin to be engaged in. Every library that hosts OJS, ha in fact, every library that hosts B Press, has student journals. And when we do the counts, when I work with Kevin, we have to sometimes work through hundreds of student journals that we want to separate because people are thinking, oh, well, they're not, you know, they're student journals. But of course, when you work at Stanford, there are different kinds of students and different kinds of journals. And I work with one, you're welcome to look at it, called Intersect, a, a, an undergraduate journal of science, technology, and society. And they came to me this last quarter in the spring and said they'd crossed the 150 citation point for their journal of undergraduate students without any self-citation. And this idea that students can begin to contribute um, is a very important part. But let me focus on, on my topic for today. You did not get a title. Brian did a nice promotion for the book. It's not out yet. The galleys are sitting on my computer. I need proofreaders. It's my least favorite task. I squirm. I cringe. Because in proofreading, you can only make the slightest, smallest changes. And I want to rewrite the book every time I read a sentence. But I'm going to share with you some of that because this conference has been critical for that. In 2007, I didn't have the book. But in 2009, the next conference we held in Vancouver, I had started on this book. I sound like I'm proud of the fact that it's taken me this long. I'm not. But it has been something I've kept coming back to. And it allows me to step back from the work of the sprint, from the, from the uh, work that we've been doing around building code, the document support that we've been doing, the book support that we've been doing, to talk about this larger sense of purpose, the historic place of our work. Now, those of you who have attended all of the conferences, you know your next one is free. If you get your card stamped at the door on your way out, then the sixth conference, you get a free one. Kevin's looking aghast at that uh, concept, but um, let's hold that idea perhaps for, for a moment or two. In, 2000 in, in uh, 2009, excuse me, when I first started, I did a whole thing on John Locke and intellectual property. Um, and John Locke is an English philosopher who provided a theory of property that was not so much original to him, but that had a sticking power, the timing the need for an idea of where property stops and where the commons begins, or rather maybe the other way around, where the commons begins and where private property encroaches on it and what are the rights and limits of that property. And Locke has been fundamental to that and nobody cites Locke more than intellectual property experts because his notion of ownership is something that you only have a part of, that you earn a part of something, that you have a property claim on something, and that there is no absolute ownership, 
that are only earned or right in terms of those claims are very important. But that was 2009. In 2011, I talked about the monasteries, the role of the commons as the origins of the sharing of knowledge, and how in monasteries there was no private property, and how the monastic life based on the benefactors, on the gifts and donations of Pacific Press, of the church, of the nobility, created a space for learning in medieval Europe where it was nowhere else available. And that idea of the protection of learning is a very important idea for today. And that's why I want to transition to the chapter I'm presenting today. This is like before you go to bed, you get another chapter every two years of this, and then you won't need to buy. There will be an open access copy of this book. We negotiated with University, I negotiated with the University of Chicago Press. They had never done this before. They had a very weird notion of what open access is. You could put your file online as long as you change the title and all of the words to it. We, I negotiated them down from that. We'll have the, the, real, the actual title of the book, The Intellectual Properties of Learning. But let me give you this context of why this is so important. What the battles that the, the monastics fought to protect their autonomy, to protect their, their, their support from benefactors, the battles that were fought by the Bodleian Library, I actually gave a, a talk at SFU as part of my uh, time, at, part of my project at SFU, or my appointment at SFU, about the Bodleian Library, which has uh, been very reluctant to buy any books and was based entirely, almost, almost entirely um, on donations of, of illuminated manuscripts and established a contract with the publishers to give one free copy of every book. I'll come back to that in a moment. That was in 1600, the beginning of the 17th century, and I'm going to jump to the end of the 17th century because I want to talk about the origins of intellectual property and I want to relate it to the Elsevier Napster moment that we're having today. Okay? Now, I and Elsevier are not working in cahoots, but the timing of yesterday's purchase or this week's purchase of BE, I don't really know, BE Press or B Press, their purchase of yet another of the players um, speaks to the issue. So I want you to keep in mind the following facts about where we are on this open access quest. Here in Montreal, one of the leading centers of information science in this, con in this continent, we have established, and with some help from people like Juan as well, we have established that the open access point we're at is 50%. 45%. I read your abstract in 2015. But there's enough argument between 45 and 50%. Half of the literature is available. Your chances of getting an open access article is 50%. Your doctor, looking at your symptoms, looking for what is new, has a 50% chance. Now, some of us still think that's kind of ridiculous. Others are thinking, my God, it's up to 50%. And the official count, and Juan's recent study with uh, Vincent and others have established around 35, 38% for the whole of the literature, but in uh, recent literature, sorry. Um, but in 2015 in particular, this 50% point seems to be about three studies seem to converge on that aspect. That's one factor of the tipping point. Second factor of the tipping point, Elsevier has announced a surprising fact. I love the way they did it. You should look this up. They say, here are some surprising facts, and they have a light bulb going on. And one of those surprising facts is they are the second largest open access publisher in the world. Exactly. The response they were expecting, and my first response too. Elsevier, second largest open access publisher in the world. And it only took 20 thousand articles, no, no, sorry, excuse me, 40,000 articles to become the second largest publisher in 2016, excuse me. Third fact, Elsevier as well. It won a $15 million suit against Sci-Hub. It sued this young, now I, again, we can be careful about some of the facts in this, uh, Alexander Elibakin, is being sued by Elsevier as the key representative of Sci-Hub, so he certainly has owned up to that. There are questions, and Jean-Claude has uh, raised some of them uh, very recently, about who's behind it all. In fact, uh, you suggested a spy novel perhaps could arise out of uh, 
of such fabrications around Sci-Hub. But Sci-Hub has established, and the research that came out uh, this month, sorry, last month in July, has established that almost all of the literature online is available through Sci-Hub. And this idea that all of a sudden the subscription model has had the life drained out of it is part of this tipping point. And that Elsevier, on the one hand, is very proud of being the second largest open access publisher and goes to court over to, esta over to establish its ownership, its outright ownership, its treatment of that ownership as absolute in a non-John Lockean manner. That it is a corporate asset that all of the work that we have done as researchers, all of the work that we have organized and provided for others through libraries, is a corporate as asset. And Vincent Lariviere's research has established that five publishers are now in possession of close to 50% of the published literature. Think about these 50% that there is a 50% ownership, there is a 50% open access, and that is the kind of tipping point. And there is a sense of chaos that I want to come back to, a chaos around what model going forward for open access. Is it the APC? Is it the institutionally sponsored journal? Is it going to be owned by the second largest open access publisher. Do you have any predictions who's going to be the first and largest open access publisher in two or three years? And yet, who owns 50% of the literature at the same time? Now, I set that out on the table because it is definitely a tipping point, definitely a teetering in terms of our future. That is our future as scholars, as members of this institution, as people concerned about the future of students and the future of the veracity of knowledge. And I want to provide a historical analogy. I do want to go back to John Locke and create a comparable situation, and I do want to pull some hope from that. Because at some points, and some of the responses to B Press's acquisition by Elsevier on lib license, on Skullcom and some of the other listservs was people throwing up their hands and saying, what can we do? So the period I want to return to is the turn of the 17th century. And what I want to provide to you is the idea that learning held its own at the most traumatic moment in the history of publishing, which I want to portray as that moment when the origins or the le legislated state of, I was going to say open access, the legislative state of copyright was put into place when authors were first recognized in 1710. Locke is dead by then, but he plays a role. And I want to use Locke as the scholar activist, as the public defender of learning. And I want to make an argument that says we have a reason for activism and a reason for hope and a reason to be realistic, and a reason not to be naive about who's at work here. Joe Esposito, not my favorite consultant in terms of publishing, although he took me out for lunch 30 years ago, weirdly enough, and it's in New York. Joe Esposito said last night in response to the BE Press that it just shows that Elsevier is smarter than everyone else. Now, I hope he did that as a provocation, it certainly applies to him, but I think at the same time it is an exaggeration. And we want to think about the possibilities in terms of these historical precedents. So in 1695, actually in 1693, let's start with John Locke at the beginning, the Licensing Act for Books is about to expire. The 17th century had a copyright. It was very much the law in the 17th century, but it was the stationer's company the printers and booksellers, there were no publishers, they were printers or book booksellers. Elsevier, there was an Elsevier, another Elsevier that Elsevier picked up the name of. Elsevier was a bookseller. And this idea, a little bit later than this though, this idea that we could, uh, that they could own monopolies as a privilege from the crown was copyright. 
They had perpetual ownership, the printers and booksellers, throughout the 17th century in exchange for censorship. The state, the crown, and the church wanted censorship. They understood the power of the press, and in return they granted the publishers, as we might call them, the booksellers and printers, granted them monopolies. Not just monopolies on a single title, but monopolies on all of law. Monopolies on school books. Monopolies on all of Milton's work. Monopolies of any kind or sort. The Stationers Company was happily granted those in return for censorship. And this law passed repeatedly, going back to Henry VIII, of course, as everything does, in the 16th century. This law came up for renewal in 1693, and people were fed up with it. This was the 1662 version. An act for preventing the frequent abuses of printing seditious, treasonable, and unlicensed books and pamphlets, and for regulating of printing and printing presses. You've got to admit that there's an honesty. It's not called leave no child behind. It's called we're going to stamp out any form of treasonable works. The universities, even then, were recognized. Oxford and Cambridge were allowed to print on their own permission. They did not need the stationer's company in London. And there was a lovely divide between the London printers and booksellers and the universities. They were a world apart. Now, it may only be 55 minutes on British Rail today, but in those days, in the 17th century, Oxford and Cambridge were considered to be so far removed that we can let them print whatever the heck they want. And so it had been. But everywhere else, there was regulation. And in 1660, excuse me, 1693, after the Glorious Revolution and there was the first Bill of Rights a year before, people were fed up with book licensing. John Locke in particular. And Locke's battle... He had a very good friend, Edward Clark, who was a member of Parliament. He began to engage in lobbying, not something that philosophers often do. And maybe Frederick would be someone to do that. He began to engage in law lobbying through Edward Clark to stop book licensing. He felt that the licensing of a book was to gag the freedom of speech. He felt that it presumed you were guilty even before you had spoken. He felt that anything that could be said should be able to be published. You can sue for libel. You can sue for blasphemy. He had no problem with that. Locke was a quite a religious man. But the idea that everything had to be licensed first was contrary, and worse than that, it made learned books really expensive because they were all published under monopolies because these monopolies were perpetual, because they kept out foreign books, because you could not undertake a new translation. Locke himself did an Aesop fables, could not get it published, because his printer did not have a license for fables. So this idea that censorship was critical to academic freedom and academic freedom was related to the price of access to knowledge is a critical aspect. He lost. It was renewed in 16, 1693 for two years. But in 1695, he was back at it. And they were able to prevent book licensing, the Book Licensing Act of 1662, the licentious and, or sorry, the seditious and treasonable unlicensed books law was not renewed. And for the first time in the history of printing, well, not quite. There was a, a little period in the early 16th century when there wasn't. But for 150 years of censorship and monopoly ended in a single day. The next day was a reader's paradise. There had been only one newspaper in London, the official Gazette. The next day, I'm exaggerating, perhaps not the next day. It took them a day and a half to set the type. 
But within a decade, there were 18 London newspapers. If you waited a day, any newspaper that was printed would be available the next day by someone else who reset the entire newspaper and sold it for half the price. It was Sci-Hub Galore. And from 1695 to 1710, it was an unlicensed press state, a field of academic freedom that England had never known. Holland had had the whole time, but England had never known. There was, I have to admit, some obscene literature published. Continuously on a 24-7 basis for 15 years. The Crown faced a lot of criticism. Everything that was published was republished and pirated. And the publishers, the printers and the uh, booksellers were upset. And every single year they lobbied, they paid, they went to Parliament and they asked for new bills. Please relieve us of our misery. Every Elsevier of the day, and there was an Elsevier by that point, every Elsevier of the day begged for a return to licensing. Can't you see? They would gather up cartloads of obscene material and dump it on the doorsteps of Parliament and said, this is your freedom of the press. And the members of Parliament would take a few, go home with it, check it out. In the meantime, they changed their strategies. In the meantime, they started with the licentiousness of the press from 1695 into the 18th century and complained about the obscenity and got nowhere. Because having 18 newspapers made for a vibrant democratic spirit. The members of parliament found people that were in support and against them. They gained new ideas. They were able, in fact, to see that there was a different kind of democracy through that process. And the press was exasperated. The printers and booksellers looked for new strategies. Now, in 1695, Locke had made some proposals that had not been accepted. In 1695, Locke said, and he does this in a beautiful way. He takes the author and the learned reader, and he starts to balance their interests. He says, for the author, the problem with a monopoly is it's perpetual. That impedes learning. It discourages further criticism or critical use, critical additions, new translations. At the same time, we need an incentive. So Locke actually proposed that the property in 1695 should be vested in the author. They don't have an absolute ownership. They, it should be vested in the author for a period of, he originally starts with 50 to 70 years. Now, I give, that, give you that figure because it's amazingly prescient. Do you know the Canadian-U.S. situation right now? Exactly. 50 Canada, U.S. 70. Whoa, spooky. Let's get back to the facts. That is a fact, by the way. Because, but the second time he proposed it, again unsuccessfully with, through Edward Clark, he left it blank. And he just said, for blank number of years. And what I think is a very democratic spirit and I think a very smart lobbying technique in which you allow the parliament to make some of the decisions while you insert a principle that will protect learning. Because he balanced that author concern with the reader's concern. No restrictions on imported books. The principle that Bodley had established a book deposit needed to be honored because it hadn't been. The idea that every book that was published should go to Cambridge and Oxford, one copy free into these outer learned economies that were separate from London, had not been honored. And Locke wanted it reinstituted in a way that said, first, if you want to publish a book, it doesn't have to be licensed, it has to be deposited in the library. We need to guarantee scholars access. 
in order to ensure the value of the work that we do. And he, impo- he proposed, not imposed at all, proposed that unsuccessful but still kind of clever solution. He got involved in the mechanics. He was the Heather Joseph slash Michael Geist of his day, involved in proposing legislative approaches. But it all went for nothing. Jump ahead, this unlicensed state, this chaos, to 1705, 1706, when Daniel Defoe, remember Robinson Crusoe, comes on and he says, you know, the problem with this unlicensed state is, is that it's creating chaos and it doesn't encourage learning. And this phrase, the encouragement of learning, became critical. The publishers, the printers and booksellers picked it up. And they said, we've got something here. What if we said, we don't care about the licentiousness, we don't care about the piracy, we're thinking this is not to the encouragement of learning. And within two years, there was a bill that was successfully passed in 1710 that was an act for the encouragement of learning. And that carried Parliament, that principle, Now, there is a debate among historians that if the publishers, if the Elseviers of the day put forward encouragement of learning is the reason to vest the ownership in authors for 14, could be doubled, or could be renewed to 28 years, was it really for the benefit of the publishers? Who did profit after the Statute of Anne and the first copyright law was instituted, even though it mentions the authors or their assignees, it was the publishers. The big publishers definitely gained and profited. And did the authors thrive? Well, when you look at the actual clauses of the act, what they include is book deposit. One copy of every book to nine libraries. Scotland was now part of the Union. Edinburgh. Where's my Nate? And the North was recognized. So there was an idea, that, that, that idea of, of preservation for academic purposes was protected. A second one was instituted, and this was the idea of pricing. That the university, the administrators, the provost of the university could roll back high-priced books. Now this was dropped but it was an amazing, it was about 1735, I want to say, 1737. So for a period of 25 years, and the argument it was never really used, but even the idea that, that the universities could roll back book prices, that Parliament had passed such a law, and that law had been proposed by the booksellers, and that Parliament had overwritten the booksellers' interests at a number of points that they had tweaked and twigged the nose of those publishers in order to protect learning. Is this moment of hope that I want to talk about. Another aspect, let me just briefly introduce, another aspect was that after 14 years, no matter who owned the material, it went back to the author and could be renewed for another 14 years and could be sold. But the idea that you could at some point as an author take back your work and edit it take back your work and revise it, was built in to the origins of copyright. And this possibility of balancing the rights of the author and the rights of learning in each of these clauses is a powerful concept in a law that was not only sponsored, but was paid for. That is, at the time, the tradition was whoever was backing the bill had to pay the costs of printing of the bill and the management of the bill. And the stationer's company is on record for having sponsored the Statute of Anne in 1710. The results of that, I mean, the interesting stories about the Bodleian Library library being overwhelmed by the number of books it received over the 18th and 19th century and all those kinds of, of aspects to it. But it was generally a turning point. We think of it as the age of modern copyright. We think of the author's rights as being instituted, but we don't 
give enough recognition to the rights of learning, the protection of learning. And so what I want to say that today, in looking at our current tipping point, and look, looking at the might of the oligopy that is the five major publishers, and looking at the ownership of intellectual property, and looking at the future of these models, that the reasons to become involved as an activist, the reasons to start a high school journal, the reasons to support open access and open data and open science wherever you find it, there is some encouragement for that. It was a time of unlicensed printing at the turn of the 17th century. It was a time of very powerful printers and booksellers. It was a time when they were ready to exploit learning to achieve their financial goals, to ensure their profits. And through all of that, learning managed to establish its place in the law. Now, much of that has been lost and much of that has been protected. Legal book deposit, there are countries all over the world, including this one, that have legal book deposit. Not every university library gets a free copy, unfortunately, but we do have a national library where these materials are still preserved. We have exceptions under fair use. My own personal feeling about this is that we need a separate category. That in this book that I've been working on for way too long, and that will come out, I'm hoping, in December, if not January. In this book, I talk about the, the intellectual properties of learning as a distinct class. There is something different about the work of learning. Whether it's a research article, whether it's a learned book. There's something different about how it has been funded, supported, invested in, and how its value is realized by a society. And the balance that John Locke tried to strike between the commons of learners and the interests of the author for 14 or 50 or 70 years is exactly that sense of balance. And so when Conrad Black made his donation, actually it was the people before Conrad Black, but when the Pacific Press made its donation to start the Pacific, start the Pacific Press, start, Pacific Press made its donation to start the Public Knowledge Project, there's that same kind of relationship between the larger world, that same kind of balance, and same kind of accountability and level of responsibility, so that all of the work we do, we make it public because we owe it to the public. We make it public because we are accountable to the public. And we make it public because we find it will have only have its value through that public circulation, through the broadest, widest possible circulation. So each of the projects that you see presented in what follows, yesterday we had the lightning and hail of Montreal, today we have the lightning talks of the PKP conference without the hail and a little drier. In each of these presentations that you see, you'll see the results of the sprint today at 4 o'clock where people we're developing code under open source software principles in order to enable others to find a platform to share what they know and to help others to share what they know. In all of that, I want you to see that we are reenacting a history of intellectual property, but more importantly, a history of that relationship between learning and the world. Thank you very much.